Good morning. It is 6.14 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Calendar reads March 3rd of 2019. Who knows? I want to thank everyone who responded to my post from yesterday and has been praying for me and thinking of me. And I, I can't tell you from the bottom of my heart uh, how much that means to me. Um, I am, however, probably going to be uh, sucking on a cough drop um, this entire video because uh, one of the chemicals that they give you in CHOP chemo, um, you, you have to drink water while they're, while they're putting it in your port cath because anything they put in your port cath actually is, is going to come up in your throat. Anybody who's had a flush uh, through a cath or something like that, or, or even through an IV, knows that when you get flushed, you can kind of taste it in your mouth, you know. So you have to do that. And that's probably why I got thrush the last time around. Uh, this time I've been just basically gargling with salt water and just using lozenges or mints to deal with the uh, the taste. <clears throat> so anyways, that's that. Thank you, everyone. I'm, you know, I'm doing my best and, and, you know, we're getting by. Now, there is one thing before I start. I do want to ask uh, for those of you who have shown so much uh, care. Um, I have a nephew. Uh, his name is Matt. Yesterday, he was admitted uh, into a hospital and they found a malignant colon. A uh, tumor on his colon, I'm sorry, and uh, have started procedures immediately to uh, try to relieve uh, the, the blockage. Um, and um, they're going to have to do surgery very, very soon. And um, of course, because of the, <laughs> the strong possibility of metastasis or the spreading, uh, they're probably going to have to do some sort of chemo, and, and and it's quite possible because of the nature of it that it's going to be the serious kind of chemo in that family, maybe that 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 I'm having, and he's he's much younger <coughs> younger than I am. He's he's I'm 44, he's 31, um, and he lives very far, but our whole lives he's been quite close. He, you know, he was born when I was 13 to my oldest sister, and he's been like my little brother. So, <laughs> any prayers for him would be very appreciated, and uh, thank you. So, concerning the material, man, oh man, this next section in Owen's uh, apologetic article is... It, it by itself is long, and it's dense. Um, and the issue is, it is dense with bits of information that I, I don't think can necessarily exist by themselves. Which, of course, was the reason that I, I did that, um, that first uh, addendum uh, extra video uh, with the green cover. On it because yeah um we're getting a picture from Owens but you know like with any document that you're going to take and use for research and, and that's the thing about research is uh, anybody who who starts to seriously dig in to any uh, form of research that's worthwhile you're gonna find that, that 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 really is the that really is the gist um, to research is just pouring over documents after documents, uh, many of them seeming like they might not have a lot of importance at first, or seeming like they they may have and uh, a great majority of the the material turns out to be. Oh, not as helpful as you thought. It can be hard. Uh, sometimes it can be frustrating beyond belief. But that's, I mean, that's really what it takes, you know, to, to start trying to draw uh, a, a 
a picture or, you know, not create one yourself, but, but try to get that one to emerge from uh, a gathering of informative sources. And no, it, it doesn't hurt at all, nor is it uh, disingenuous to have a theory that you're working from, or, you know, if not a strong theory, at least um, a vague theory. And there's far too many questions about the land that um, Americans live in. I say we, but I, I know that there's so many people from other countries that are, you know, that listen to this too. Um, well, let's just put it like this, okay? I, I, I live on the land of America. Um, and I am also a descendant of Israelites. So, for those of you out there who are uh, on the land of America and a descendant of Israelite, this Israel, this have a different meaning to you than those who are not on the land and are yet descendants. However, we can be assured that um, we'll all be gathered together. Um, and, I mean, does that mean that we're all going to come from every nation that we're in right now to this one land, um, you know, as as like a full eschatological um, fulfillment uh, of so many prophecies about us having to return? Um, I don't know. I'd be completely honest with you. Um, we can see just from the the great variance of uh, our different uh, sub-racial peoples uh, that have come. And when I say something like that, I mean, you know, I could just say as a blanket, Germanics. And there's a reason for that. It's not, it's not just because I'm German and, you know, I look at everybody else, um, Dutch, <clears throat> sorry, I mean, Dutch, Belgian, um, there are are Germanics on 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 either side. There's there's Danish, and and I also consider English and Celts. Now and here's why: it it's partially a language thing. In a way, it is, um, because English is most dominant Ger German, and then it's got a mix of a lot of other languages in there with it too. But, um, but in a way, people type. So a lot of people, if they're going to try to describe us, well, you know, what do they see as the, um, the, the end time uh, expression of the preservation of Israel? Well, you'd have to, you know, basically, in a sense, you could express it as like the Holy Roman Empire, in a sense, because uh, those kingdoms that made up the stronghold of uh, the Holy Roman Empire, now I'm not, not talking about Rome, the Pope, per se, you know, I'm talking about the kings and the kingdoms, all right, that, that, that were, in a sense, uh, functioning as one for a very long time. Um, that is, I think, a very uh, powerful expression of, of um, what people types I'm looking at and thinking of because of, first off, their fulfillment of much of what was promised to our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Um, so some would say, you know, Germanic, uh, Celtic, Anglo-Saxon, um, uh, Teutonic, uh, Nordic, Scandinavian, kindred, you know, folk, okay? Uh, folk. Um, I just call them Germanic folk, and I, I don't mean to insult if anybody thinks that's, you know, um, if, that, if, if that seems like too much of a broad umbrella. I don't mean to insult, um, but that's who I'm talking about. And so this is, you know, this is meaningful to you. Um, I know that the enemy is filling your lands with those floods, those hordes, uh, to try to overcome you. And uh, they're doing that in my country too. They're they're just more successful in doing it secretly in my country because it's so big. Um, it's so big, and that's a funny thing, you know. There's so much. There's so much land for the people that even exist, and this is um, this is not about those things. It's it's about prophecy coming to pass. It's it's about the Bible being just as vital today as it ever was, always has been. They've just 
tried to make it seem like it's not. This is why we have to go through these histories. We can't just look at at these instances of, of J. Smith, the Mormons, why did they head to Utah, what was going on in Nauvoo, who were his associations beforehand, who helped him actually uh, translate uh, the first book, and who was surrounding him, uh, what was the uh, makeup of his family, um, things like that. That's great, but um, we've got to look oftentimes hundreds of years before because there is this there is this uh, there is this great lie, great deception, the man of sin um, building and building um, in his weight and his force and and, and his influence in uh, what we consider sciences and what we consider pursuits of truth. He has successfully um, pushed his set of lies into all of these things that should be considered as disciplines of truth. So we're in a spot, okay, but we need to be hopeful because we're not, we're not in the worst spot. We're just in, a, in a, a situation, in a time and place where it's time for us to stand up, it's time for us to do something. Uh, for the generations to come to fulfill prophecy, okay, so that Yahweh is glorified and his son Yusho, it's not Yeshua, that's the Masoretic, it's Yosho. And if the, anybody translating English Bibles would have gotten it right, they would have just translated into English Joshua. <clears throat> so we're, we're, we're going to bounce around a little bit. I'm not even going to start with reading from the text of the prophet and Freemasonry from Lance Owens from his Mormon apologetic because there's a couple other things that uh, I want us to look at first. And the first is actually just one paragraph, one small paragraph from Henry Ford Sr.'s compilation of articles which has been put into book form and available on PDF uh, and I will include that in the links too. You should go to this link, you should download this PDF, get it on your computer, get it on a flash drive so you can read this. Uh, it's called The International Jew. All right, One single paragraph in The International Jew and then we're going to take a look at the Bible real quick. So now I'm going to show you quickly why this paragraph matters. If I scroll up one page and uh, start at a, an earlier paragraph, he writes, To make a list of the lines of business controlled by the Jews of the United States would be to touch most of the vital industries of the country, those which are really vital, and those which a cultivated habit has made to seem vital. The theatrical business, of course, as everyone knows, is exclusively Jewish. Play producing, booking, theater operation, and all in the hands of Jews. Think Ticketmaster, people. <laughs> this perhaps, uh, perhaps accounts for the fact that in most every production today uh, can be detected propaganda. Sometimes glaringly commercial advertisement which does not originate with playwrights but with producers. And folks, he's writing this in the early 1900s, okay? Now he goes on. Bullet points. The motion picture industry. The sugar industry from the very early days. The tobacco industry. 50% or more of the meatpacking industry, upward of 60% of the shoemaking industry, men's and women's ready-made clothing, most of the musical purveying done in the country, jewelry, grain, more recently cotton, the Colorado smelting industry, magazine authorship, news distribution, the liquor business, the loan business. Now that's what they were dominating in his day, the early 1900s, and a lot of things have changed since World War I and World War II, which were just two parts of the same war. Now, this is the last paragraph in the section. He writes, Indeed, it might be said that the Jew has succeeded in everything he has attempted in the United States except farming. The explanation usually made in Jewish publications is that ordinary farming is far too simple to engage the Jew's intellect, and therefore he is not enough interested in it to succeed. But that in dairy and cattle farming, 
where the brain is more necessary, he has made a success. Numerous attempts have been made in various parts of the United States to start Jewish farming colonies, but their story is a series of failures. Some have blamed the failures on the Jews' lack of knowledge of scientific farming, others on his distaste for manual labor, others on the lack of the speculative element in agriculture. In any case, he stands higher in the non-productive employments than in his basically productive one. Some students of the question state that the Jew never was a man of the land, but always a traitor. For which assertion, one of the proofs offered is the Jews' selection of Palestine as their country, that strip of land which formed a gateway between east and west and over which the overland traffic of the world passed. Um, <clears throat> and an interesting note here, too, is when you understand that they have always failed at farming, always failed at farming. But funny enough, oftentimes when they project themselves in their propagandistic films and plays and, and stories, they oftentimes make them these people of the land, these farmers, and they're not. They're not. This is a fact. Now, consider how all of these uh, in the, uh, the early days, like in the 30s and 40s and, and 50s, um, they had all these, you know, kibbutzes uh, over there in Palestine and trying to make everybody seem like they were making that land bloom, which was all a farce. It was an utter farce. Uh, they, have, <laughs> they have managed to turn certain uh, parts of land um, that were more desert into areas that definitely are um, uh, far more... Uh, full of, of flora and, and forested, but, but those things were done by engineers. Uh, they put tons and tons of money into that for that deception uh, to, to go down. And, and they really, at that, have failed to. They, they act like they're, they're such a producer over there of, of so many um, goods, but they, they aren't. I mean, even their, um, their uh, livestock industry, um, they have to import... Um, the feed uh, for that. They can't produce that. Okay. So that, that's, that's just a fact. Now, what does it matter? I'll show you why it matters. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 4 Cain and Abel, or Keen and Ebel. Now, in the course of time, and I'm not reading this directly, I'm, I'm paraphrasing until we get to about verse 11. In the course of time, both Keen and his brother, Ebel, brought sacrifices or offerings unto Yahweh. Now, Ebel was a man who kept livestock, and he brought the best of his livestock for an offering and the fat thereof. And Keen was a man who tilled the ground. He was a farmer. And he brought his. Now, a lot of people have said it was the nature of the sacrifice. He required uh, a blood animal sacrifice, and Cain didn't bring that. Well, I don't know if that's the case, because when you check like Leviticus concerning all the offerings and sacrifices, um, he absolutely accepts the fruit of the ground for a number of offerings. So we're not told that that's the reason, but there was something about Cain's offering that very much displeased Yahweh. And so, when Yahweh was displeased, Keen's, uh, basically his mood fell. He was, he was pretty ticked off. And um, it doesn't seem like he was, he was really getting it, you know. And, and Yahweh uh, tried to reprove him, not in a harsh way, but to correct him and tell him what it would take uh, for him to improve. And um don't think he wanted to. And I think his heart was cross from the start. So he lures his brother out into a field, probably so that they are uh, quite alone. And I don't know, not thinking that Yahweh was watching or, or what, he murders his brother. He was a murderer from the beginning. And when Yahweh asks Keen, where's your brother? And of course, his answer is so disrespectful. He says, am I my brother's keeper? 
Yahweh says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. Now you are cursed because of the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. From now on, when you till the ground, it won't yield its strength to you. You'll be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth. That's why it matters. That's why that, that fact that Henry Ford Sr. pointed out in the early 1900s matters. Now, I can go through the Old Testament and show you where the Kini, which are the people of Kin, uh, have mixed and mingled with various peoples over all the years, which peoples have been the constant enemy, antagonist, uh, problem bearer for Yisrael for one reason or another, and it's typically because they usually would let them stay and mingle in the land with them, and when they had uh, strength over them, put them to tribute, and sometimes not. Uh, actually, they were uh, King Shaul, the first king of Yisrael, was uh, actually quite benevolent to the Kini when he went to war against the Omliki. This is a thread that you can follow throughout the uh, so-called Old Testament. So, bringing us back towards uh, the paper and why these things matter. You see, I know there's a lot of people out there who, st they're listening to these uh, broadcasts, if whatever you want to call them, podcasts, I don't know, my videos. And they know that I'm identifying an antagonist. And I'm identifying a last day people of Yisrael, who they are. And um, because of, of certain various um, theologies we might have, uh, some people might lean far more towards um, our antagonists or worldwide antagonists being uh, more Romish, okay? Uh, and there are many documents out there um, that you can find that will show that Although, I don't see the, the, the Romish church as uh, having a purity of beginning. And, and of course, I, I do not agree with uh, many of the, the doctrines that they hold. Uh, the, the Romish church or Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, and those um, w which are quite close in the way that they believe and practice. Um, I don't agree with them. Uh, however... Um, I do see it as being a bulwark uh, against this treachery for quite a long time. And of course, whomever has controlled the history and publication of uh, history and materials and records for four or five centuries now has had a great influence on the way that we view uh, the various institutions and peoples and happenings of old. So I, w I would, I would Im implore you to consider, uh, con to consider that because you're talking about the difference between blood and water, okay? Um, when the Jesuits uh, are said to take their extreme oath of induction, okay, and they, they say that, that pretty vulgar um, pledge, Okay, one thing they do is they say to uh, to work at wiping out their execrable race, not belief system, race. Blood is thicker than water, and you know, with all of these schisms in in the church, all of these denominations. I absolutely believe that the key that we're looking at is Obri. That it's going to repair so many of those things. You know, there was once a universal church. Um, how right or wrong it was is another story. But even, um, I think, even being uh, not, not the purest expression of, of, uh, of faith and practice, it was still 
a great bulwark against the man of sin. <clears throat> so, Owens is going to be talking about Smith, as he calls him, the prophet, and Freemasonry. And there are two things that have to be pointed out before we even let him start in on this because these things of course he's not going to be pointing out whatsoever and you have to you're gonna have to understand why he's not doing this and the Mormon LDS mindset especially about um, Jewry Judaism okay I, I've mentioned this before but we have to understand that um, to understand what was going on with Smith and early influences and leaders in LDS. What was going on? Okay, I'm going to start out with something that's uh, that was actually written by Colonel Jack Moore. Anybody who's not familiar with Jack Moore, he um, get familiar with Jack Moore, please. Um, that's a something that you can find uh, still all over YouTube for now, right? But um, uh, a lot of his uh, discussions and uh, and lectures, and he was quite quite uh, the the interesting character. So, let's see here. From the Masonic Trowel dot com, which is so interesting that they publish uh, these this paper by Moore and some of the other stuff they publish because they seem so pro Mason, but they would they're just putting it out there. I just am shocked. Um, from the start of the document, the leaders of Freemasonry love to boast about their leadership in the French Revolution. So do the Jews. Quote, when the Bastille fell, unquote, said Bonnet, the speaker at the Grand Orient Assembly in 1904, quote, Freemasonry had the supreme honor of giving humanity the chart which it had loving, lovingly elaborated, unquote. On August 15, 1789, the Constitutional Assembly of France, of which more than 300 members were Masons, adopted almost word for word the form determined in the lodges, which became known as the Declaration of the Rights of Man. It was a simple denunciation of the kingship of Jesus Christ and membership in his body, the Church. The French state openly declared in this Masonic prepared document that they no longer acknowledged any duties towards God or Jesus Christ, and that they no longer recognized the dignity of membership in the Christian Church. It organized a vicious attack against Jesus Christ and his kingdom, which has been carried on relentlessly until the present day. That was their first step. The subservience of Freemasonry to Judaism soon showed itself. When the question of Jewish emancipation came up in the Constitutional Assembly from 1789 to 1791, it was Masonic Deputy Mirabeau who linked up with the Jews of Berlin and A. Dupont who rendered the first secret service of Judaism by Freemasonry. There were many more such acts to follow. By 1789, the French state had completely ostracized Christianity while admitting Jews to full membership. This accounted for the uh, domination of state after state in Europe by the Jews. During successive Masonic revolutions from 1789 to the Spanish Revolution in 1931, the world had heard of the enlightening reforms which separated church from state. With these reforms came the proliferation of divorce, secularization of education, the suppression of Christianity, the neutralization of private property, and the unrestrained license of the press for the glorification of world Zionism and Masonry. As early as 1922, the Assembly of the Grand Lodge of France began to work towards the formation of a United States of Europe as the forerunner of their Federation of the World. In North America, Canada, and the United States, Masonry and Zionism worked hand in hand as they invited these two Christian nations to give up their sovereignty and enter a world federation which would be controlled by Masonic Jews. But we had enough patriotic congressmen in Washington at that time, and their dream was disrupted 
and our entrance into the League of Nations was voted down. Now, uh, Colonel Moore continues uh, at length, and I will be posting this link uh, in the description of this video, but uh, I want you to see something just as loud and clear as you possibly can, and that is the Jewish domination of Freemasonry. Uh, its origins, which again, Owens did touch on those origins. I hope you'll remember that small part where I had read to you that there were two German researchers a couple of centuries ago who actually looked into the origins of Freemasonry, whether it was in the craft guilds and Solomonic, as it's often described to you know the broader public, or whether it was entirely esoteric and more derived from uh, Kabbalah and its offshoot branches, and they found that that it in fact was. It was entirely Kabbalistic. All the signs, the symbols, uh, the acts, uh, and I would have to imagine that the way that it was made to proliferate around what still would have been considered Christian Europe, even in the face of, of so many different philosophical uh, emergences that were challenging Christianity and sciences. Uh, even in the face of that, I would imagine that it was still passed off very heavily for quite a long time as um, Christian or very friendly to Christianity um, because they work slowly. They work in, I mean, they. <clears throat> you talk about people that work long term. They do. They do. Do not underestimate these people who hate us, despise us, and wish to fully subjugate us. And I say fully because they already have in many ways. And it, it was told us in Deuteronomy that if we should forsake the law, the statutes, the judgments, that uh, these nations that, that are among us would, would get over us. And, um, you know, everything would go wrong for us and we wouldn't prosper. Um, all we have to do is look around at the churches in, in the U.S., Canada, South Africa, uh, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, the white countries, uh, Iceland, of the world, U.K., and see that they are mostly either involved like in the United States in a 501c3 relationship with the state, which is voluntary, or they have adopted uh, some sort of form of that type of corporate structure in those other countries. You cannot have that. The church cannot peacefully coexist with an evil state like that. And, and, and they can't coexist with the state in that sort of relationship, period. All it is is bribery to the leadership um, and and not just that it, it was it was really uh, most of the churches back around the time of Johnson and I'm talking about in the United States were were really in a sense uh, tricked into doing this and then once they're in they're in and it's hard to get out it's super 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 hard to get out because you basically have to look at the possibility of losing everything that you thought belonged to the church it doesn't But that factor alone, that factor alone is what's going to keep our enemies over us. Over 90% of the church in the United States, 501c3. We have to get away from that. And the, the first way that we're going to get away from that is education concerning what 501c3 means to the church as an institution, as a body. It's supposed to be a body, right? Well, they've turned it from a living body into a corpse that they rule over. And so everybody, I would, I would just um, encourage you, learn as much as you can about 501c3 in the church and get involved with a local congregation and get to know people there because there are true Christians there. Now that congregation um, in its form may not be truly Christian. The leadership may not be truly Christian. But you're going to find people in that congregation that are truly, they're Christians. They're going to help you. 
too, by the way, because you aren't an island. You can't stand alone. Okay? Yes. Uh, j just about everyone a uh, church around you is going to be corrupt to one extreme or another. That's true. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about going in as missionaries with love, not just going in there and, and beating them over the head with this, because I know how that goes. But we've got we've got to have relationships folks they're going to be cutting off they're going to be doing everything they can to cut off our online presence we got to get back to flesh on flesh you know person to person spirit to spirit relationships we have to that's the way it was meant to be this is totally unorganic that our relationships and our experiences are like this and I know why don't get me wrong of course I know why but please 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 get yourself involved with the local congregation with people that you can interact with that you can get to know a lot of them are lost um, and you know what a lot of you are confused about things you know it, it, come on what are we you know we're not better than one another we're we're all we're all experiencing a very a very similar experience but many people don't know why but with love i think we can help our people our people there are people you know whether whether that whether that church is full of a very good decent sincere hearted folks or not there are people go find churches full of our people and be involved and i'm taking i'm taking my own medicine i'm doing this also and it it's been hard the last few years because i see all the problems inherent in the system and there's a lot of times that I haven't gone, participated in anything. A lot. But I'm taking my own medicine. So now <clears throat> that we understand that Freemasonry, by the late 1700s, is, we're not saying it's dominated by Jewish influences. No, it was dominated by those influences from its start it's that it's becoming overt it's becoming very well known and we're seeing this expression through uh, quite literally through the government of of France and what was going on with Freemasonry there however this was ubiquitous now one more thing that is really <clears throat> important to pay attention to and I, I think this helps to explain why, well, first off, a lot about why Mormonism is Mormonism. Now, a lot of people do see the, the Masonic aspects to it. Some people will see the <coughs> Kabbalistic aspects, aspects to it. And, um, you know, obviously, Owens has to admit up to all of this because they're obvious. But, of course, Owens is always trying to convince us of archetypes. He's justifying Kabbalah. He's justifying Judaism. And Mormonism is, is aptly described by, I think, many objective onlookers as philo-Semitic. Now, I'm not going to call it that because Semitic is the wrong term. It is philo-Jewish. There are many, many conversion stories that you can find of Jews converting to Mormonism. Um, there are many, many Jews involved in Mormonism. Um, a man can be, if, if somebody claims to have Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish blood as far as the Cohens go, and it's, it's pretty funny too, you need to read that, the international Jew and find out just how many Cohen's th there were <laughs> it's insane I mean there's just absolutely no way that the uh, it's actually in in the Bible in Obery it's a Ken that is a high priest is a Ken that's what they're called and here's the thing folks 
keep this in mind, that there are kens of other nations. Pagan Canaanite nations have kens too. But anyways, yeah, you can if you can show that you're you're a Cohen, um, you can can serve as uh, I think some type of a bishop. I'm not going to go through everything. All right, let's start with this um, Jewish symbolism and Mormonism. The LDS Church includes among its traditional symbols the Star of David which has been in use among Jews since at least the 13th century. For the LDS Church, it represents, among other things, a divine Israelite covenant. Israelite regathering in the affinity of the Jews, and it's prominently depicted in a stained glass window in the landmark Salt Lake Assembly Hall. You bet it is right up front. They got that just stamped right on the front. Oh, now this is what I'm saying. Not only is Mormonism so extremely Philo-Jewish, and you can see why. I'll have this document in the description too. Um, but I have found that such an overwhelming number of people that leave LDS, leave Mormonism, just end up going from that to something else that is extremely Philo-Jewish. Um, because I, I think what a lot of people don't realize, they, they can see or feel or sense the problems in LDS and they get away from, you know, that oppressive thing and they, they, they get a lot of guys, like there's this, this one guy who had this TV program for a long time where he'd let people call in and he'd argue with them and, and he'd go through, he'd show you all the, um, all the, the problems in Joseph Smith's uh, documents and, and everything else. But, you know, I looked at him as a gatekeeper. Uh, I don't trust the guy. I don't have his name, but you can find him real easily on YouTube if you just, you know, uh, somebody against Mormonism is called... Uh, he had a show. It was called something like The Heart of the Matter or something like that. Uh, I don't trust that guy. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't like his person. Um, I don't like his, his flamboyant look, to be honest with you. Um, I don't like the way he engages Mormons when they call. Uh, it, it, to me, it doesn't seem like he, he's really caring for his people. Um, because that's, he doesn't look at them as that. And, and that's the thing. I do. I do. I look at people that are my racial similars as my people. And if you want to call me wrong, then you're going to have to reference Paul from Romans chapter 9. So the guy appears to exhibit very little love for his people. Um, and, as I said, I think he might be a gatekeeper because, of course, he doesn't bring up anything. He, he and a lot of other people that I see as gatekeepers in all of this, they, they are going to try to convince you that, that one guy or a couple of guys could have pulled off a con that has built an empire. Give me a break. Now, another thing that you have to um, keep in mind is that um, Mormonism holds that many extremely special events in the course of the life of Joseph Smith and Mormonism in general happened on Jewish holidays. Uh, and they have a whole bulleted list here that I'm not going to go through. Now, in the section Mormon and the Jews, it says LDS assert peaceful coexistence with the Jewish people whom they recognize as Israelites, who simply never lost the knowledge that they are Israelites, because they're not reading Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9. The first Jewish cemetery in Salt Lake City, Utah, was on land donated by the LDS Church, and the first Reformed temple in Salt Lake was funded by the LDS Church. The fourth governor of Utah was Simon Bamberger, a Jew. And something else you need to keep in mind, a lot of these names that are going to come up, that's the other reason why you need to get and download the International Jew. Because you're going to see name changing and how that was done and how that continues and how insidious it is. Oh, and one other thing. Do you know the Smith family were not farmers? It's rumored that they weren't farmers because they couldn't farm. They were bad at it. 
take that for what you will. It's a rumor. The other thing I'm going to tell you is that, um, just paraphrasing, um, so Mormons, they're, they all believe that they're from a certain tribe of, of Israel. And apparently it would be just the Mormons that would be of these Latter-day tribes of Israel. I guess if, if you're not a Mormon, don't convert to that faith. It doesn't matter because you're going to hell. And um, they, they have this knowledge of what tribe they're a part of, right? And they, they just keep it secret. It's just among the family. That's what it's, that's what it says. Yeah. So just understand that Mormonism is utterly, absolutely, thoroughly, um, Philo Jewish and they're totally Zionist, totally Zionist. So they're actually an enemy of their own people. They're an enemy of their own people. Prove me wrong. This is still the same cough drop. I'm doing pretty good. So, to the prophet and Freemasonry, picking up uh, where Mr. Owens left off, and we're on the last page of this great document. Let's see what we can uncover. Whatever one concludes about the varied hints of scattered early associations with Hermeticism, Joseph Smith had well-documented connections with one of the tradition's major legacies masonry. The prophet's associations with the Masonic tradition are thoroughly documented and discussed by Michael W. Homer in this issue of Dialogue. It is unlikely that Smith would have so fully involved himself and his church with the Masonic tradition if he had not sensed therein some intrinsic compatibility with his own religion-making vision. As Homer demonstrates, the prophet said that masonry was, quote, taken from priesthood, unquote, and his followers continued quoting that observation for 50 years after. I have no doubt it was taken from some sort of priesthood. That was me. It is possible that Joseph's interpretation of masonry as a legacy of ancient priesthood was based in his own understanding of a history extending back hundreds of years, a an history entwined with the Hermetic mythos and with Kabbalah, alchemy, and Rosicrucianism. The alliance of this occult legacy with Masonry was well understood by esoterically inclined Masons. Assertions of such links were bandied about by American anti-Masonic publications in the late 1820s. As noted, Joseph's own history several times touched Hermetic Kabbalistic traditions. One could argue that he even interlaced them within a creative, visionary sense. My goodness. <clears throat> I'll leave that up to you smart people to unpack because this is, this is just loaded with, uh, oh my goodness. He's, he's, he's selling this one. He's selling this one. This, this guy's good. Now he continues. Joseph's contacts with the Hermetic mythos were sufficient to generate vague assumptions about Masonry's earlier roots, and these assumptions could have been an historical subtext to his remarks about Masonry being a remnant of ancient priesthood. Interestingly, modern historical examination of the occult tradition suggests a shadow of truth in Joseph's statement. Kabbalah and Hermeticism as representatives of an historical stream of occult knowledge, or as reservoirs of Gnosticism, did claim ancient lineages of priesthood, in quotes. Joseph had every reason to take those claims seriously, as do historians today, albeit within a narrower interpretive context. In this light, Joseph's connections to Masonry may take on several different shades of meaning. Now, that guy I mentioned earlier who did that TV show, I think it was called something like The Heart of the Matter or something, okay? Um, it's interesting because he would get people on there. He had a caller that I listened to, and, and I have been doing everything I can to absorb to absorb everything I can concerning uh, not only Kabbalah and the branches of it uh, on down the years, uh, but also um, the mythos of Mormonism and the arguments 
on both sides, the people. I'm I'm not I'm not staying I'm not staying sterile to this. And 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 know this. My people, many of my people, our people are 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 involved in this. And as I said, many of them when they get away from it um due to the more superficial uh reasons that most of us would hear about. They are still so indoctrinated into that philo Jewish mindset that they tend to go on to things like, you know, messianic and uh, what calls, calls itself Hebrew roots and stuff, okay? And so they're just as entrenched in those heavily, heavily, heavily Jewish, Kabbalistic, Talmudic thought systems, Judeo Christianity, you know? And we got to get away from that. It's no good. They, the two cannot mix. The two cannot mix. Um, so he had a caller that uh, was very, uh, I mean, the guy, the guy definitely had a lot of contempt for him because he would reveal uh, things that would go on inside the temples. And the funny thing is, it, it, you take the same kind of oaths in their temples that you take in Masonic temples. This secrecy and this this priesthood within these these temple rites and rituals and stuff, guys, guys, come on! What is it we don't understand about Yusho saying that he didn't say anything in secret? Whose example do we follow? Do we ex do we follow the example of Yusho, not Yeshua? Yusho. Do we follow his example? And do and say nothing in secret, and have no secret oaths and fellowship. Or do we follow Smith's example? And and whatever uh, fiat rules that these elders want to lay down, as pragmatism dictates, which is quite obvious. If you look at at all the change-ups that have been made. Um, claiming Smith to be such a prophet, but but making making distinct pragmatic changes over the years. Now he continues: the ubiquitous influence of Kabbalah upon the occult traditions of the 19th century has been stressed, but its specific import in Masonry requires repeated emphasis. Noted historian of occultism Arthur Edward Waite suggested in 1923 Encyclopedia of Freemasonry that much of the great and incomprehensible heart of Masonry came from Kabbalah, the secret tradition of <laughs> is not Rael. He finds such important Masonic symbols as the Lost Word, the Temple of Solomon, the Pillars, Yakin and Boaz, the concept of the Master Builder, and Restoration of Zion, all derived from the lore of Kabbalah. The organizer of Scottish Rite Freemasonry in America, Albert Pike, manifested a similar sentiment and indexed over 70 entries to the subject of Kabbalah in his classic 19th century study, Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Though Pike's work was published in 1871, his views reflected lore already established in Masonry during the period of Joseph Smith's Masonic initiations, Masonic initiations three decades earlier. Indeed, one of the earliest documentary mentions of Masonry appearing in 1691 specifically linked it with these Jewish traditions. As Homer notes, the Scottish Rite developed by Pike was an evolution of the 18th century French Masonic Rite de Perfection, which in several degrees was influenced by Kabbalah. Now, folks, you'll recall the words of Colonel Jack Moore concerning French Masonry in the late 1700s and the effects that it had worldwide, how they absolutely abolished a loyalty in any way, shape, or form, even uh, uh, perceived loyalty to Christ, him who was called Christ, Messiah. So I can't stress enough when he writes that 
Homer Notes, the Scottish rite developed by Pike, was an evolution of the 18th century French Masonic rite, the perfection. He continues, Kabbalah's importance in Masonic lore is also witnessed by Martinez de Pasquale in his late 18th century Kabbalistic Masonic restoration of the ancient priesthood of the order of Le Elu Cohen. Much of this Kabbalistic influence upon Masonry may have come from Rosicrucianism, again recalling their close association, infused as it was with alchemical and Kabbalistic symbolism. But some additional influence might be attributed to esoteric sources like the Frankist movement. The Frankists, followers of Jacob Frank and successors of the Kabbalistically inclined Sabbatean heresy, had become active in Central European Masonic organizations in the late 18th century. Given the wide diffusion of a Christianized and Rosicrucian version of Kabbalah into Masonry, Joseph Smith probably heard something about the tradition during the course of his almost 20-year association with Masonry. <laughs> and Masons and Freemasonry. I love it. Yeah, this guy, he has no shame. Mr. Owens, if you're out there... You have no shame. No shame. Okay. It might be argued that these occult Masonic inclinations were all part of a sophisticated esoteric form of European Masonry foreign to the world of frontier America. To the contrary, and though not yet fully investigated, there are several reasons to believe that what Joseph Smith encountered in Nauvoo was an esoteric interpretation of Masonry. As mentioned earlier, between the mid-18th and the beginnings of the 19th century, a multitude of occult orders rose from Masonry. Each of these tended to develop its own interrelated system of symbolic ceremonies for conveying distinct esoteric visions. The different rites also often claimed variant authentic Masonic origins in ancient Egyptian mysteries, in the lineages of the medieval Knights Templar, in Kabbalistic transmissions, and in Hermetic alchemical Rosicrucian traditions. Robert McCoy's 1872 Encyclopedia of Freemasonry cataloged over 45 distinct systems of Masonic rites developed during the period from 1750 to 1820. And I have to interject and say that, like any other organization who has opposed these people over the centuries, I would be very careful what you believe concerning the history and deeds of the Knights Templar and Jacques de Molay, their whole organization, and how they functioned and operated. Okay? It's, I think we really got to reconsider a lot of these. And here's why. I told you, Henry Ford... Henry Ford wrote back in the early 1900s a treasury of knowledge uh, that is still available for us today in, in what's called the International Jew. It was, uh, of course, a string of, of articles that, that were uh, published in a newspaper he had to buy just so that they would get published, the Dearborn Independent. Um, you know, keep it in mind that because he opposed them and, and was so successful in opposing them that they have trashed his name since. Keep that in mind. So anytime you see any organization or people opposing them over the centuries, keep in mind that they have probably gone out of their way to trash the reputation of the, that people or that organization. Owens continues, in retrospect, one might suggest that during this unusual epoch in creativity, elite groups of individuals coming from many sectors of society encountered in the Masonic mythos a new medium for expressing their visions. Though basic York Rite or Blue Lodge Masonry with its three degrees was a common grounding for most of these, around that foundation appeared many layerings of esoteric accretions. With the tools of allegory, symbol, and imagination, and in a format suggesting great mysterious antiquity, men touched by the Masonic mythos began producing new ancient rituals. And one is reminded of Irenaeus' uh, complaint about the Gnostics responding to the creative muse of their times. Quote, Every one of them generates something new, day by day. 
according to his ability, for no one is deemed mature who does not develop some mighty fiction. And um, I guess just to get maybe even more people upset with me, uh, I will tell you that the first name that comes to mind when I read that is absolutely, totally, completely guys like Michael Heiser, uh, um, L.A. Marzulli, uh, Rob Skiba, and uh, the folks working with him on, on his whole seed. They have, they have taken something that is, that is actually a clear message to us concerning lines, seed lines, and they have perverted it with material that is historical, it is biblical concerning giants. Giants did exist. They existed before the, fl the flood of Noah. They existed after the flood of Noah. And keep this in mind. They existed before. They existed after. There's reasons they give, which, again, esoteric. These people are, are utterly uh, s subjected to works like the Book of Enoch. And you need to consider something about Enoch and its popularity. In time, there were two Enochs, folks. Remember that. And remember the duality that is so inherent in Kabbalism and this, this witchcraft and wizardry also all in, inherent in it and spawned from it. This old world Canaanite sorcery. That duality. Remember, there's something that they're going to say. And in one way, it's going to have an um, exoteric meaning that's that's what they want the cattle the goyim to think and then it's going to have the esoteric the the adept okay enoch keep it in mind enoch so we we hear enoch and we think for instance the quote from jude enoch the seventh from adam he prophesied saying okay also there was another enoch please don't forget this after Cain is expelled and he's given that curse that he can't farm anymore. The, the ground will not uh, yield up its strength to him anymore. And keep in mind that Yahweh visits the sins of the fathers down to ten generations of those who hate him. Okay? And if those fathers keep hating him, he keeps visiting. Now, when Cain left and was expelled, he went away and he had sex with his wife she had a son, and his name was Enoch, or it's more appropriately, Hanuk. That's the same one from Adam, uh, Seth's line and from Cain's uh, line, Hanuk. Um, they both had an Enoch, and what did Cain do? Well, he couldn't produce from the land anymore, so he builds a city. He wants to become lord of the city, and who is lord of the city today? And he names this first city after his son, Hanuk, Enoch. There are two Enochs. So you do have to wonder why these people that change a far more clear um, doctrine of truth concerning different seed lines that we see in Genesis from what it actually is to a great mythos of giants and... Uh, the sex with women and everything like that, 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 that is the central point. See, you've got a very small, obscure passage in Genesis 6 that you've got to pull from, whereas the other possibility of the expression of what we're supposed to be seeing in these seed lines is all over Genesis. It's painted all through the text as compared to a very small portion. So it's definitely something to, to think out and way when when you encounter these folks and their uh, spin. Now, <clears throat> he continues, John C. Bennett, one of the more enigmatic figures in Mormon history, was the indisputable impetus to Masonry's introduction in Nauvoo. Bennett's mercurial career among the Masons as fascinated and bewildered historians. Seemingly from out of the blue, Bennett appears in Nauvoo and was baptized into the Mormon Church in the summer of 1840. 
Within less than a year, he became mayor of Nauvoo, chancellor of the University of Nauvoo, major general of the Nauvoo Legion, assistant president of the Mormon Church, and an intimate friend and counselor to Joseph Smith. Yeah, and that just happened by accident, right, folks? In June 1841, less than three months later, becoming assistant president, he began attempts to organize a Mormon Masonic Lodge. But the masonry he brought to Nauvoo had several unusual occult aspects. Less than a year later, masonry has several unusual occult aspects, yet jerk. Sorry. You know, well, how much can I put up with without popping? Less than a year later, he made an equally dramatic exit excommunicated amid a flurry of allegations suggesting widespread sexual improprieties. What a surprise. Now you're gonna see, even from the early days, guys, this, this is not, again, he's selling, man, he's selling. This is not a Nauvoo thing, okay? Uh, from the early days, Oliver Cowardy, and other associates before that. His family members. The... But he does this. It's amazing. You know, somebody really could do a study on Mormon apologetics and show you how it is, it is a, a, a carbon copy to what we see as exoteric Jewish apologetics. You could see that in um, that, little bit, that little bit of an article that I read um, from an Orthodox Jew that was talking about like the four different ways that, that they inter uh, interpret Torah, as they call it, There. It, it is exquisite sophistry and casuistry. So now, by the time he arrived in Nauvoo, the 35-year-old Bennett had attended Athens State University. He studied medicine with his uncle, the prominent frontier doctor and Ohio historian, Dr. Samuel Hildreth, helped to found educational institutions in West Virginia, Indiana, and Ohio, organized at Willoughby College the medical school and served as first dean and professor of gynecology and children's diseases. Been a licensed practitioner in Ohio, been appointed brigadier general of the Illinois Invincible Dragoons, and in 1840 became quartermaster general of the Illinois State Militia. He had also apparently abandoned a wife and children, been ejected from at least one Masonic Lodge for unbecoming behavior. God, what does it take to get ejected from a Masonic Lodge? <laughs> for unbecoming behavior. And been accused of selling medical degrees. Are we starting to see a name change here, folks? Bennett's interests, including religion, medicine, and the military, and masonry, suggest a person inclined towards investigating the more esoteric aspects of masonry. Yeah. His apparent libidinous proclivity may also have aroused his curiosity about unorthodox sexual practices associated with more creative Masonic rites. The guy was a perv. He was a perv. A perv. And a perv who chose gynecology as his medical uh, speciality. And therein is my constant concern about male gynecologists. Okay, let me just real quick pump the brakes. Uh, I know I said a lot concerning Bennett and then concerning masonry and the lodges and stuff. Okay. <clears throat> Assuming that the general practice of the lodges hasn't changed very much in 100, 200 years per se, keep in mind that lodges today pretty much just function as uh, people people want to get in oftentimes because it's connections these people are ambitious and you know I know this is strong judgment but it's oftentimes because they are they are deep inside weak and afraid and this is their way to garner strength instead of putting their faith in our Savior um, but the way they function 
are, are pretty much like a civic organization in, in this very similar ways to the ways like local churches function, JCs, any civic organization. They don't want to get into the occult aspects of it. They'll, they'll learn as much as they need to to be considered part of uh, the brotherhood, whatever else, and function. And they believe that this is going to enrich their life to a certain degree. They pay their dues. Those dues goes up. Those dues are part of evil activities. And you know what? They're not innocent. However, they perceive things in a very different, very, very, very different way down there. And if you try to explain to them where this really ultimately goes and, and the heart of the whole matter, they're, they're either going to think that you're lying to them or really what they, they don't want to hear it. <clears throat> now, the only issue here is that I don't see Bennett in any way, shape, or form functioning at that lower level there. He's far higher level than that. You look at all of his associations, all the things, and, and not just the, the, the positions that he, that he gained through Smith and um, uh, LDS and Nauvoo, but, but positions he had before then, and his father, and his family, and his education. This factors into uh, a history. And I promise you that we tra if we could trace Bennett, if we could trace Bennett, we would trace him back to, you know, Canaanite, Canoni, Omlaki people. Now, uh, uh, moving forward, so given the revelation between Bennett and Smith, Bennett probably had communicated some Masonic ideas to Smith before petitions were made for the formation of a Nauvoo Masonic Lodge in 1841. That the temple endowment ceremony developed by Smith in May 1842 was influenced by Masonry cannot escape notice. But beyond the temple endowment, several other components were developing in Joseph's vision during this period that sounded an even stranger resonance with ideas from esoteric Masonic quarters. To stand out, organization of an order of Illuminati, or political kingdom of God, and introduction of spiritual wifery and uh that was some real creepy stuff going on over there it wasn't just bennett all right um it's been well documented that uh smith and what he had going on with with various women straight up adultery like taking other men's wives having sex with other men's wives if this is not clearly documented prove me wrong and therein of course was a great uh core of the problems because you're going to have problems. You're going to have problems. You start fooling around with other men's wives. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Spiritual wifery, my foot. The guy was a pervert. Bennett claimed that in a revelation dated 7 April 1841, the day before he was made assistant president of the church, a year after he moved to Nauvoo. Joseph Smith personally commissioned him to establish an order of the Illuminati in Nauvoo. Through the organization, though the organization was not then specifically called by this name, a revelation received by Joseph on 7 April 1842 commanded formation of the kingdom of God and his laws with the keys and powers thereof and judgment in the hands of his servants. Now this, the, okay, the problem is the next few paragraphs, it's it's heavy propaganda and you know so far I have not read this document word for word because it's not the point of what I'm doing here um, though it was loaded with it's just loaded with a lot of information just dense information okay a lot of propaganda where of course Owens just jumps back and forth admitting uh, Smith and his family's Masonic ties and origins and Kabbalistic ties and origins and rituals and all of this stuff. But, oh, but he must have been influenced by this person and that person to do this and that and the other. And a constant, constant, constant defense, defense, defense of indefensible stuff. Okay, that's, that's all we're seeing right here is mostly Owens defending a lot of indefensible crap. So... He essentially uses um, Bennett, in a sense, as the reason. Like when we just saw that uh, the meeting hall in Salt Lake City with the big star of David, and the fact that um, the temple that they had in Nauvoo was so Masonic. Uh, I believe he's trying to pass the buck, and he tries to do this a lot. 
but the problem is you can't just say it, it, it's it's like being not so naive as to say that history just all happened by accident you know no hidden hand nobody behind it history happened by accident joseph smith just a and 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 here is the i'm just going to give you this is this is the typical um exoteric polemic that we all get joseph smith was just a very very talented con man and his whole family of course was behind him I mean, his whole family behind him um and, and he made up uh, all of these stories and he sold them to so many people um even though he couldn't sell a copyright of uh of his translation to anyone but he sold it to all these people on his own. He's just such a good con man. Sold it to all these people on his own. All these people followed him, and these fellowships sprang up everywhere on his own because he was he was so good at his con on his own. This all happened. He built so much of an organization on his own, and after his death, that in my opinion, again, was this not a martyr's death? He 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 murdered two guys before they killed him. Um, and then after that, still had the steam. Um, it's it's still got traction. It's still got speed. And off to Salt Lake City. And for what exactly? For what exactly? And who was Brigham Young? I notice a lot of people have this stance, they defend Smith, and they condemn Young. And of course, I'm looking at it from the outside. As I've told you, the people that are in any form of religious expression or biblical heresy that, you know, that are my people, I feel deeply for and I love and I wish for them to to come into the light of truth. So this is this is not one of these things Catholic versus Protestant and Mormon versus evangelical because I'm none of those. This is my people. <clears throat> and I'm looking out for my people like you show told me to do for the wolves. And I'm looking and I'm seeing wolves. I'm seeing wolves that have rounded up many of my people in the past. And they created this, this, uh, this very big flock, these wolves, because they were constantly circling. Some way off in the distance, you couldn't tell. They're keeping them. Keeping them separate. Keeping them separate from the rest of the sheep, the rest of the flocks. And I, I see this as organized. I see this as designed. Um, maybe in some ways it's sometimes looser, in some ways and sometimes much tighter, much stronger as it went forward. That's what I'm seeing. Um, and the rest of this section, again, is, is simply going to be passing the buck from Smith to Bennett. Um, the very last paragraph says, In Nauvoo in 1842, and after I suggest Joseph Smith encountered a reservoir of myths, symbols, and ideas conveyed in the context of masonry, but with complex and more distant origins in the Western esoteric tradition. They apparently resonated with Smith's own visions, experiences modulating his spiritual life from the time of his earliest institutions of a prophetic calling. He responded to this stimulus with a tremendous creative outpouring. The type of creative response Gnostic myth and symbol were meant to evoke and eventually had evoked across a millennium of history. But leaving masonry, there was still another more primary transmission of this esoteric tradition that would touch Joseph's creative imagination during his last years in Nauvoo. Now that's the way he ends off this section. However... Keep in mind what I read concerning what Jack Moore said about revolution and the Jews and what Lance Owen said at the very beginning of this paper about Joseph Smith's um, intrinsic relationship to Kabbalah, which he always chalks up as archetypes. However, 
he says that he believes that this should essentially make Mormons, LDS, into revolutionaries. Into revolutionaries. It should be a revolutionary movement. Am I insane by thinking that one thing that they believe that they have there is a huge, uh, a huge organization with a lot of money and power that are, in a sense, a Zionist sleeper cell? And I'll end off with that. Uh, hope to talk to all of you again very soon.